a lifelong passion for me. It uh, really is the font of our identity. Byzantium, to me, always meant me. It was the whole of me. And I also think as an American, because America is in some ways a Roman Empire, there's something so, uh, the Greek word would be pelos, pelagon, there's something so vast about America, and there's something so vast about the realm of Rome, and more so of Christian East Rome, that I will never have enough time to, to appreciate fully what it means. Having said that, uh, Byzantium and our Byzantine heritage is all too often a heritage and a history that's hidden in plain sight. Now whose fault is that? I would submit that we, as successors of Byzantium, carry most of the blame, and we need to build awareness of it. But it's also the fault of historiography and the fault of the other successors of Byzantium. We're, we're going to talk about this. And by the way, there will be plenty of times for uh, questions, criticism, arguments, because we are Greeks. Most of us are. <laughs> But um, <clears throat> let's start on a few salient points. What is Byzantium? Byzantium is the Greco-Roman Christian civilization that continued after the fall of West Rome. Not the fall of Rome. Rome did not fall, right? I mean, we don't need to repeat it. We're, we're adults, but most of us, right? Uh, Rome did not fall, so it is the continuation that continued for oh, barely a thousand years. How many civilizations do you know? How many political enemies lasted a thousand years? Right? So this continued for a thousand years. And the French have this term Byzance après Byzance, Byzantium after Byzantium. It didn't fall even afterwards. Because what were we for the 400 plus years, in some cases 500 years, of Ottoman rule? The Rum Millet. All Orthodox Christians, from Belgrade to Baghdad, from Belgrade to Baghdad, were rules, were own key. Right? So our political identity remained frozen in time. Unfortunately, no longer in superior, but in an inferior position for all that time. But the Byzantine identity never stopped. And it's still there, hidden in plain sight. There's an anecdote in 1912 when the Greek Navy, commanded by my fellow Hydriot, one is, after all, always a Hydriot, and the revolution uh, celebration is coming up. Well, Admiral Kuriotis is. Uh, fleet took over the Eastern Aegean Islands, and uh, Greek Marines landed on uh, Lemnos. So some of the local kids came up to the Marines. Now, some of you are probably are nodding, so you already know where I'm going with this. So the boys are peering at these soldiers. The soldiers are like, uh, what are you looking at, Pedia? Oh, we came to see enemies. Soldiers, are you not editing this yourself? No, sir. We are Romani. So that identity remains and fused with the Hellenic identity to be all of us. We're all Romani. We're all editing but we're all Romani. There is no mix. There is no dichotomy as the great. Uh, <clears throat> Hellenist and author Patrick Lee Fermer would say, there is a unity in being a Hellene and a Romeo. It's hidden in plain sight. Look at these flags. What do they all have in common? And where does that double-headed eagle come from? Byzantium. Now, what are these the flags? The first is the Albanian flag, 
And I made the big mistake uh, off of Monastiraki of uh, commenting to a kiosk owner. I said, uh, why do you have the Albanian flag there? I just thought it was. He said, young man, why are you so ignorant? I was like, well, you know, where do we start? I, you know, he noticed the slight American twin, you know, from the but so he's like, he says, young man, this is the Byzantine war flag. The fact that Skanderberg, who was a Byzantine, carried it into exile into Italy does not change the fact that it is the Byzantine war flag. I stand corrected. Uh, I won't make that mistake again. I've said that to many Albanians. Uh, of course, my wife and children all know that by heart. Uh, the flag in the middle is a flag that I'm very fond of because I am what the Serbs would call a Serbsky Zet, uh, which would translate uh, into several Sagambros. I am a Serbian son-in-law because my wife is Serbian, and for three years I lived under that double-headed eagle. Uh, the interesting thing about the Serbian flag, and most Serbs don't know, there are two Byzantine symbols within the Serbian flag. And I'm going to walk over here and point them out. Not only do you have the double-headed eagle, you have the tetragrammat. They have the saying, Samo sloga Serbina spasala, which means only unity will save the Serbs. But that was, Aftoto Basilio, Ineto Basilio, Don Basilio. This kingdom is the kingdom of the king of kings. What better way to invoke the unity of the political and the spiritual that the Byzantines had? The Serbians don't forget where they came from. And then, of course, there's Montenegro, which is uh, now split from Serbia, also having the double-headed eagle. So right here, you have either knowing or, un or very knowing Serbian successors. So what this also tells us is that a common culture binds us to our neighbors. And as we said, throughout that period of the Ottoman Empire, we were all Romani. And you had people of different ethno-linguistic groups, but the same cultural and political identity that lived as one group. That's what's hidden in plain sight in the Balkans today. And what do we always think of when we hear the Balkans? Well, there's even a, there's even a uh, term, Balkanization, to split up into little parts. Notwithstanding the fact that there is an underlying cultural unity that's never really been played. That card hasn't been played. <clears throat> now, as I've said in the beginning here, the Greek identity is very much coming out of the Byzantine identity. But as you see, our neighbors also have this. But neither our neighbors nor we Greeks really mention our Byzantine heritage. When you think of Greek heroes, what do you throw out? What kind of, what kind of names? I mean, please, let's be interactive here. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Alexander the Great. Good. We've got the, so we've got the we've got the heroes of twenty one. But who does conventional wisdom? Uh, what when they think of Greek heroes, who do they think of? Alexander the Great. Plato Nidas. This is Sparta. Right? <laughs> Sorry. You're gonna wish I put that back now. Right? This is Sparta. Right? Great. And right, said you're a Spartan, so you, you understand that. I, everybody respects that. So Lily is uh, the you know, battle of Salamis. Do we ever talk about Justinian? Do we talk about the martyrdom of Constantine Paleologos, the last Byzantine emperor who died sword in hand? We talk about the 300, right? And we should. I mean, this is a part of our history. When do we talk about Constantine Paleologos? How many, even within our own community, know about Constantine Paleologos? Not as many as know about Leonidas. And my point is, you've got to know about both. 
if you want to know your history as a Greek, you got to know about both. But it doesn't stop there. The Basil the second, the Euphoros Lucas, the story of the Akritis. And let's go to the theological. The theological. What other country and civilization conquered the souls of people with an alphabet army? Who? Byzantium. We'll talk about that in a second. But today, how many blockbusters have you heard of that are talking about Byzantium? Does anyone have a movie where Byzantium is even mentioned? Anyone know one? Okay, let's hear it. She lights up a movie, I'm watching one right now, the Turkish Empire, oh, they can really conquer Byzantium. Well, there is a blockbuster. Yeah. Uh, there is a Turkish blockbuster, yes. Well, there may be something mentioned in Byzantium, but a movie that's, let's say, about the exploits of Basil II, or the love story of Justinian and Theodora, this is the exploits of the Akritis, the, uh, the two Arab invasions of Constantinople that were fought off asymmetrically. One of you know why I use that term, asymmetrically, with Greek fire. That's another... That's another battle of Salamis, okay? That saved Europe. In the Western uh, civilization, do you hear about the Byzantines saving Europe? You know what you hear about saving Europe? Charles Martel at Tours saved Europe. Leo the Asarian, not so much. You have to really look for it. You have to study East European history, or had a father like my late father, who was also an icon, so I honor his memory as well, who had all the tomos, all the volumes of Historia de Vinicu Ethnos. So what I know, I owe to my late father and to all of those volumes. But the point is, you don't really hear about it, right? You don't talk about it. Let's go back to the whole issue of blockbusters because we are visual people. We are people that love films. I mean, my, my son is always on YouTube, but that's, uh, I don't want to go down that uh, route. That's a digression that uh, I deal with enough at home. But multimedia-wise or media-wise, where is Byzantium the conventional wisdom? Does it even exist? Now, there are scholarly books written about Byzantium, but it doesn't exist in the realm of popular culture and even of discourse. Okay, and this is a silly example, but you'll all appreciate it because we've all seen the movie. In Big Fat Greek Wedding, did Mr. Portokalos talk about the history of our people and mention the Byzantines? No. Not one word. Although, when he's explaining to all of his neighbors why the Greek Orthodox Church was so important. If he had had some background in Byzantium, he might have been able to do that. But he didn't. And often enough, we don't. Or we haven't built the awareness, both within the community and without, about this culture. And honestly, how do you explain to your fellow Americans why we who honor the ancients and then these heroes that march down on Dodecanese Avenue that don't really seem to be connected. How do we explain who we are if we don't talk about the 2,000 years in between? Is it going to work? It isn't going to work. And we don't have anything in popular culture and in the media to talk about Byzantium. The only movie I've seen about the fall of Constantinople was Fatih. 1453, which a dear Turkish friend of mine sent to me. And it was the most schmaltzy thing. It was, it was high budget. But, you know, Necmet the Conqueror was a good family man. He entered uh, St. Sophia and he was kissing babies. I mean, he could have been a, an American politician. And Constantine Palaiologos was conniving defeats. You know, not the hero who died sword in hand. 
So the one high budget blockbuster is Turkish. And it only uh, serves to uphold the most primitive Turkish state ideology because so many of my friends, and I have so many Turkish friends who are educated, just said, this is embarrassing, right? But this is it. The one thing that was interesting in the, in, in the Turkish media about uh, Fatih 1453 is the, the journalists said it reminds the Turks that their greatest city was built by another and taken from another. So suddenly the Turks see in plain technicolor, I don't know if we use the term technicolor, I'm showing my age, but we get the point, that this city was built by someone else and that they took it. So to quote uh, President Obama, you didn't build that, right? You just took it and genocide it. You know, you made it into a mosque. I, I, that's my term, by the way. I've written about that. The genocidization of cultures and monuments. So you take something that's not yours and you modify it. Well, that's kind of what happened. So what about studying the Zantin? How many of you studied the Zantin in high school? A lot? Yes. Except as far as they're studying. We'll get, to, we'll get to Greek studying as well. How about in college? <laughs> but in Western civilization, was it uh, heavily emphasized? You know, a few paragraphs, a few pages. Uh, my son was uh, taking, in high school, AP World History, and I, I uh, sort of pigeonholed the teacher. I said, you are, of course, going to talk about Byzantium. So he said, uh, yes, sir. So we'll, see. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Did you, when you took, how many of you went to Greek school? How much did you talk about Byzantium in Greek school? Honestly? And I don't mean school in Greece. I mean Greek school here. Because uh, when my daughter was going to St. Demetrius Church up in um, Chicago when we moved back from Serbia, I asked, and they're like, well, why would you, um, why would we be talking about that? I said, there's you know, about 2,000 reasons, one for every year that it's covering. But anyway, I, I digress. The point is, I think we agree that it's not covered the way it should be. I mean, we have agreement there that this subject, and that's part of why you're all here, is far too important and isn't covered to the degree or to the depth or to the contextualization that it needs to be. And that's a problem, and that's why we're here. Okay, this is very simplified. But if I were to put in a timeline of Greek history, this is kind of what I do. Uh, I mean, we can agree or disagree with it, but we'll talk about the Minoans, the Mycenaeans, the classical, obviously big emphasis on the classical, as the font of Western civilization, and that's good, we should. And yes, we're Greek, so we should be very proud about that. Alexander the Great, the Hellenistic period, absolutely. Uh, Rome, you know, this, this goes, this is kind of, uh, the hodgepodge. This is the period somehow in between our greatness. Okay? Because the Romans conquered us and then this Christian thing happened and we're, we like that, but we don't really know how to put that in context. Uh, and then the church, which were really bad, happened. And then suddenly, like the Phoenix, we rose up. I mean, almost in suspended animation for 2,000 years, this nation returns. Okay, I, this is very simplified, but a lot of people that don't spend a lot of time thinking about this, including our own people, here and in Greece, because let's not forget, I lived in Greece. I saw how much people thought they knew and didn't necessarily know in Greece about history. That's a partial digression, we'll get to that. But would we agree that this happens all too often? I mean, it's a, it's a gross oversimplification, but there's enough truth in it, uh, in my opinion, to be problematic. Because how can you not talk about 
Greco-Roman Christian culture if you're talking about Greeks. I mean, how can you not talk about that? I mean, uh, the, the, the impact of Christianity on our culture and on European culture. I mean, if you suddenly don't put that into a larger context, and, and then you talk about a resurrection in 1821, sorry, it, it's not going to work for me. Uh, it, it, it doesn't fit. And it also means that when we argue for Greek positions, on any number of political and historical items, we don't necessarily know what we're talking about. Like when we say, for example, that the Greek islands have been Greek forever. Well, yes, they have, but they haven't been part of a political nation called Greece forever because this political nation of today existed since 1821. It doesn't mean that those islands are not Greek. Please, let's keep the, you know, I'm the first to say, I am a Greek island. But it means that use the proper terminology because someone will turn around and say, no, they weren't. And you won't know exactly how to argue against them. You'll just get indignant. If you know this history, you know how to defend our history better. Does that make sense? Does anyone, do we need to explain anything at this point or are we, we good? Again, is it an oversimplification? Yes, it is. But about 2,000 years of Greek history, if it's not overlooked, uh, maybe if I were to retype this, which I won't right now, underemphasized? Is that, are we good with that, Ted? I mean, certainly Ted and I uh, see eye to eye about that. When we're talking about Rome, the Roman conquest, yes, technically, Rome conquered Greece. They defeated the Macedonian army, did not, 150 BC, they conquered Greece. But Rome was always Greco-Roman in culture. And in the East, what was the Roman administrative language, please? Right. So the, the, continu the continuity of Hellenic culture never ceased. In fact, the Romans admired, adopted, uh, let's use another term, they infrastructured Greek culture quite well. And into that <coughs> basin of Greco-Roman culture and civilization arrived the gift of God in His Son in our Holy Church. We need to talk about that and understand that and own it. Do we own our Orthodox Christianity? I mean, our phones? I'll go. We own it. Do we need to own this? Our Greco Roman culture. We never cease to be Greek by being Roman. And I think that's something, if, if you're going to take away one thing from here, I think that's something that we need to take away, that that's part of our identity. Now, we all know about the beauties of the Parthenon, and it is absolutely breathtaking. Every time I'm in Athens, I look at the Parthenon. When I lived there for two years, in the Greek reality, as they say, anytime I looked skyward, I, you know, I took a breath, uh, I took an inspiration. But what about the walls of Constantinople? Not only are they engineering marvels and beautiful, but they kept a civilization alive for 1,000 years, and it took the age of gunpowder to best them. What about those? Have you ever talked about those? I mean, how often do you see this in a Greek restaurant? I mean, if, if Ted and I own a Greek restaurant, I, I don't even want to think what we would be doing. It would be a very interesting restaurant. But, yeah, we, we may have to think, we'll, we'll start designing the murals, right? But do you understand, this is an engineering marvel. And it's something that we need to own as much as we own the parking lot. And then, of course, Hagia Sophia, right? Is there anything more sublime than Hagia Sophia? Not to me. And that includes, yes, that includes the parking lot. As glorious as the parking lot is, my heart is there. 
That's where my heart is. And we Greeks often instinctively feel that, but we can't contextualize it. Well, what I'm trying to do here is start on the road to contextualization. Now, many of us are far farther than I am on this road, but I think we need to have the conversation about contextualizing this. What about art? Of course, we've got the art of Praxiteles of the ancients, which is sublime. But if you've seen the icon of the Savior in Hagia Sophia, where it looks as if he is drawing breath, I know I'm biased, I'm a Greek, but I have never seen anything more beautiful than that. That, that art is inspired by the divine and is imitating life. Uh, uh, the, uh, any of you who read the author um, Robert Kaplan, he wrote Malcolm Ghosts, he wrote, wrote Mediterranean Winter. He's not necessarily a fan of Greece, but he wrote that so often the artists are trying to uh, duplicate the beauty of nature and in Mistra, the artists almost outdid her. Now, any of us have been to Mistra, I know there's a lot of Spartans here, uh, right? Absolutely. Uh, it's true when you go to Mistra. It's absolutely sublime. And let's talk about another uh, item that's close to my heart because I am a Serbian son-in-law. The conversion of the Slavs by an alphabet army. Now, Ted and Lisa and Eric Hill uh, have heard this because I just talked about it a couple hours ago at uh, dinner, but I'm going to repeat it. My neighbor in Clemson is a Lutheran pastor. And uh, I said, you know, my late father always respected the Lutherans for uh, rejecting the uh, authority of the Pope and also for translating the Bible from Latin into German. I'm so smiling you know, over both. Uh, and team believes, you know, both got a lawnmowers next to each other, you know, total American suburban scene. And I said, but you know, the Byzantines had you beat by about 700 years. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, there are these two guys from the Saloniki, these two brothers, Cyril and Methodius. Uh, they invented an alphabet for the Slavs and converted the Slavs with an alphabet army at the time that the German Catholics were converting the Balts and the Poles by the sword. We did it with an alphabet army. And that's part of the reason why the successors of Byzantium, the Slav successors, the Bulgarians, the Serbians, particularly the Serbians, they assimilated the corpus of Byzantium in a way that you can't do it if you didn't have it brought in by your own language. I mean, Think about the Byzantines at the time. They're Romans. They're the most civilized nation on earth. But they said it's illogical that the Lord in his omniscience can only speak Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. I mean, who are you kidding? So of course they can speak all these different languages. And the word of God had to come to the people in their own language to be fully assimilated. Think about how far ahead that was. When I tell my, you know, I live, we live in the South, right? So we have a lot of evangelical uh, friends. When I talk to them about him, that and contextualize it, you see a lot of nods. You're like, wow, y'all did that. Yeah, we did that. That was us. <laughs> Protecting Europe, okay? We talk about Charles Martel. What about the Byzantines? Huh? What about that? What about so many times guarding the Eastern Gate of Europe and then being sacrificed for 400 years? Want to talk about that? Why don't we talk about that? Why don't we talk about what we did to protect Europe? Particularly in today's context, Byzantium protected Europe for all those years. No, let's give the credit to the Franks. That's easy, right? And that's what Western historiography wants. Uh, the Renaissance. I upset somebody else. It wasn't just a kiosk owner. Uh, I uh, was going through the Serbian Patriarchate in Svenski Karlovci, which is a beautiful town off of the Danube. And 
I saw these Serbian frescoes uh, made by the Serbs under Austrian rule, and I said, it's very interesting that you have this Baroque style of art in northern Serbia as opposed to the Byzantines in southern Serbia. And Patrice is like, young man, what are you talking about? He says, where do you think the Renaissance came from? It came from your people and ours. All the scholars flee. All the artists. You ever heard of Damaskinos? You ever heard of uh, uh, this guy called El Greco? Yeah. Right? And you've been to Venice, you know, the, the frescoes done by these greats in San Giorgio the Great. Anybody heard of those? So, I'm not saying you can take full ownership of the Renaissance. I mean, I'm not quite uh, that willing to make that kind of belief. But let's give some credit where it's due, because otherwise they're going to start crediting the Arabs through Spain to the Renaissance. Okay? What about us? What about all those scholars fleeing from Byzantium, from Mistra, into Italy? Are we going to talk about them? Why aren't we going to talk about them? Are we going to talk about them? This is where you say, yes, we're going to talk about them. Okay, I'm not trying to be evangelical here, but I mean, let's be a little more interactive. We need to talk about this. We need to build awareness. We need to talk about the Damaskinoses and the El Grecos and all of the scholars that fled to Byzantium or inspired them, or the fact that George uh, Gemistos Pliton, the philosopher, was so beloved of the Venetians that they dug up his bones when they reconquered briefly Mistra and took him to Italy. Okay? This is important stuff. You don't do that if you don't feel that there's some sort of connection. That at least they, in that time, they did it, as well as, of course, bashing on the Byzantines for our religion and everything. We'll get into that. That's part of the clue why Byzantium is hidden in plain sight. But why don't we talk about this? Oh, thank you. See, this is a... My kids get annoyed with, well, I mean, they get annoyed with a lot of things. Uh, and you're probably starting to understand why. Uh, <clears throat> When they eat with their hands, I said, kids, who invented the fork? <laughs> Our ancestors. I mean, it sounds like I'm Gus Portacalos, but in a much different, and I say a much more relevant, okay, guys, this is real, in a much more relevant way, okay? I said, they invented it. Now, how do I know that's true? Well, because the Venetian dialect term for fork is Piro, whereas in Italian it's Orchette. And I also know it's true because along the Dalmatian coast of Croatia, which was Venetian, which was formerly Yugoslavian, my uh, father in laws Croatian, so he spent, you know, I said, I said to him, uh, how do you say in local Croatian dialect, in Serbo Croatian, fourth, which is Vilushka in Serbian? He goes, Oh, Peter, of course. Thank you. We were sitting at the table when, uh, when we had a dispute as to uh, the provenance of the term and of the fork. We settled it. Thank you, Ted. That's, please uh, continue to remind me. But the fork, now is that important? Well, no, it's much more healthy to eat with your hands, especially in that period of such great hygiene. Okay? So no, it's not important. But, uh, Remind your friends, remind your kids, join me in being annoying and reminding them where the fork comes from. So why is the bias against Byzantium? Uh, Ted, you know what this picture is about, right? Something really, something really ugly that happened in 1204. <clears throat> well, the rest, Western Christians always resented the Byzantines. They always resented our true claim to Rome as opposed to their not so true claim to Rome. Remember the Holy Roman uh, Emperor thing? 800 Charlemagne. Uh, well, I, uh, in my German class, they said Charlemagne was der Vater Europas, the father of Europe. I said, we mind all, not my Europe. We didn't need a father because our father was in Constantinople. And he got his authority from the Father, 
and from the, the Roman inheritance. So that was always a problem. Then, of course, we have the Fourth Crusade. When you commit something so egregious, you need to do the cover-up, right? You need to then put together the historiography to justify what happened. The Fourth Crusade was when the Venetians and the Crusaders, instead of attacking Egypt, uh, after they also attacked the Hungarian city of Zara on the Dalmatian coast, they then went and attacked Constantinople rather than Egypt. So they made war on their fellow Christians and the depredations of that Europe, of that siege and conquest uh, were something that's really never can be forgotten. And they also dismembered the Byzantine Empire and the Humpty Dumpty that was put together after about 50 years in exile was never the same. Byzantium's back was broken there, and it was broken by fellow Christians and fellow Europeans. And after that point, historiography had to change in order to justify what had happened. Well, these cultural, religious, doctrinal differences then got hardened by other things, by the decline of Eastern Europe, of Byzantine Europe, and the growing strength of Western Europe, particularly after we hosted the Turks for 400 years, Western civilization, the Western center of gravity, moved towards the West and forgot Byzantium. So those with the power write and interpret history. Isn't that generally the case? Who writes the history? The victory. Write the history. So that's what was happening. And then we begin to write history in their image, because this is what we hear. Anyone know who this guy is? Yep. Do you know where it is, Father? Do you know where that statue is? No, but that's, I know what you're thinking, and your, your instincts are strong, but no. 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 Riga Spereos, 1757 to 1798. Riga Otfere, Sirski i It is in Belgrade because he was executed by the church in Belgrade. Uh, when I mentioned to my wife, uh, Riga Spereos, she goes, Oh, the, the revolutionary, Riga Otfere, of course, he's, the, he's a good guy, you know? How many of us know who Riga Spereos is? Okay, many of us here know. In the pantheon of Greek heroes that Mr. Portokalos talks about around his table, or the family sitting in Pangrati, that are talking about, they'll all know who Riga Spereos is. But is that on your short list? Probably not. And frankly, that's a problem. Because one of the things that he wanted to do was to reconstitute Byzantium, a more federal Byzantium of all, all of the nations. So the Byzantine idea after 400 years under the Turks, was not dead. Rigas Ferreos edited the first Greek newspaper. You know where the first Greek newspaper was? Where Greek first appeared in newsprint? Anyone? Yeah. Can we say it a little louder? Yeah. yeah. Right by the Greek church in Vienna, there's a plaque. Indeed. So Rigas Ferreos got the inspiration from the West for nationalism and for revolution and wanted to bring that back into Greece, into the Balkans, into Byzantium. And he wanted to reconstitute Byzantium. Of course, others and 
I don't know. I, it's hard to to uh, to get into the head of someone long dead. But others like Correis look for a more Greek nation state modeled on the French model, modeled on a common language. So you have these two things in tandem. Do we reconstitute Byzantium, which is more universal, which is less ethnic, or do we become a nation state? And this dichotomy has persisted to this day. And we are mostly the inheritors of the nation state idea, as are all the other Byzantine successor states. Yet at the same time, it's important to remember that the Filipiateria, which was founded where? In Odessa, also not in Greece, had Bulgarian, Serbian, Romanian, and Albanian members. And Greeks and Serbs fought in each other's revolutions, as did Bulgarians, as did it Albanians. Of course, that is an issue. The Albanites, I mean, I'm from Idra, I'm an Albanite. I mean, we did not consider ourselves as something separate from Greek. But the point is, is you cross linguistic lines in this revolution and you fought as Romani. <clears throat> in Macedonia, regardless of your linguistic background, if you were a Romain, you fought in 1821 for the liberation of Hellas. You fought for Romusin. Uh, that's my son and I many, many years ago in Greece. And of course, there's the other proud symbol of Hellenism, which, again, how can one not be inspired by the Parthenon? Uh, <clears throat> the image of Greece, though, in the Philomenic eyes, was not a reconstituted Byzantium, was it? I mean, even Byron. Dream that Greece might still be free for standing on a Persian's grave. I cannot imagine myself a slave, and I am slaughtering it. And I apologize to them when I'm in front of me. But you get the point. The, the Western Philelinists were looking more for a reconstituted classical Greece. Not all of them, because uh, as one dear friend uh, reminds me, the American Philelin, Samuel Bridley Howe, had a much more honest view of what Hellas was, but most Theohelines that lacked both his intellect and his experience looked more on a reconstituting of the Hellenic state. And that certainly included the first king of Greece, Otto of Bavaria, who was a fanatic Theohelene. But again, in his image, and the original capital of Greece was not Athens. It was not <clears throat> Athens became the capital, I believe it was 1834. And the choice of this tiny town was not accidental. And it was not because of any particular economic value. It was symbolic, right? And then, each Balkan state, each successor to Byzantium, assumed a similar ethnic, non-Byzantine, and often Western-oriented orientation. Let's walk through Greece, classical Greece, and particularly as it relates to Macedonia, Alexander the Great. Bulgaria used Pan-Slavism, the affiliation with Russia, not the affiliation with Byzantium, or even Pan-Slavism when it related to the Serbs, because Bulgarians and Serbs tended not to agree on so many things. Romanians emphasized their Latin linguistic roots as a tie to Italy and above all to France, to the West. In other words, the Romanians dropped. What alphabet did the Romanians use before the 1860s? Cyrillic, because who converted the Romanians to orthodoxy. Okay, so they use the Cyrillic alphabet. And if you go to old Romanian churches, you see Romanian now written in the Latin language, I mean Latin alphabet. The 
old churches are all written in Cyrillic. And I can't claim to be a Romanian speaker. I am a Spanish speaker, I'm a Greek speaker, a Bulgarian speaker, and a Serbian speaker. And I can tell you that if you simply parla Italiano and think you can understand Romanian, you've got another thing coming. Because let's start with the word yes in Romanian. What is it? Da. Uh, you know, Bulgarian, Romanian, Russian, but yeah, the point is it's Slavic. You know? Uh, and so many words that we have, they have as well. So all of these, all of these uh, recharacterizations of our identities and developments were done to suit as much our own national character as the Western perceptions of what we should be. At the same time, though, all of these Balkan states, except Albania, were consciously Byzantine Orthodox. To be Greek was to be Orthodox. And to be an inheritor of Byzantium. But you have to speak Greek. You have to, have, you have to make this jump to ancient Greece. To be Serbian is to be Orthodox. But you've got to be Serbian. To be Bulgarian is to be Orthodox. But don't be Greek and don't be Serbian. And the line between Greek, Serbian, and Bulgarian was a lot finer than we may think of it today because all of these peoples were mixed in as Roni. And as the Serbian priest that married us said, this is not a mixed marriage, you're both, you know, you're both Orthodox. Well, that was at the same time. Do you think anyone thought of a Vlach marrying a uh, Bulgarian as something strange in that year when they were all going to the same church and that church was speaking Greek and you were all room subjects of the Sultan. I mean, these marriages were arranged for any number of reasons. But that kind of an ethno-linguistic barrier at the time didn't really mean much. So we had all this division into nation states. But then every so often, I love this picture, we had these brief gasps of Byzantine unity. In the 1860s, Greece and Serbia we're talking about a common alliance to rid the Balkans of the Turks and basically to divide the Balkans on a north-south axis. Uh, you had Bulgarian antagonism. You had, had, have the Macedonian problem. And we seldom in our politics and economics used the Byzantine part to emphasize the commonalities to all of the detriments of all of the Balkan states. But let me just make a comment on that. Uh, I lived in Greece uh, in the early 2000s. I lived in Serbia. I lived in Bulgaria in the, uh, for the summer of 1994. What I found very interesting is that Greek investment tended to fall into Byzantine countries. Okay, now how do I know this is true? Well, for most of the past 20 years, the biggest banks in Bulgaria, Greek. Biggest trading partner, biggest foreign investor, same thing in Romania, same thing in Serbia, in the newly christened North Macedonia, the same thing, about 50% of the foreign investment other side, right? Albania, Bosnia, even Turkey, Ukraine. But I lived in a town in Serbia on the Serbian-Hungarian border, and I go to Hungary a lot. I, 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 I love Hungary. It's a fascinating country. The last village in Serbia would have an alpha bank or a Germanos or something like that. You cross into the Hungary, there's nothing. No Greek investment whatsoever. You go from Serbia to Croatia, the same thing. Where Byzantium ends, the Greek investment ended. So you always had this undercurrent, but none of these countries have ever played a Byzantine card. Unless it's been used against one another, or we're more Byzantine, or we're the Possessors. We're the sole possessors of this identity and everything like that. 
when it might have been better, and I'm just offering this up, and you can talk about hindsight being 2020 and everything else, but wouldn't it have been better if we had talked about the things that united us? Instead of wondering what Cyril and Methodius, their, what his, their DNA was, that they were unifying figures. But no. Bulgaria is Kirill and Methodia, Kirill and Methodia, Kirill and Methodia, Kirill and Methodia. I mean, instead of talking about what they did, we talk about who owns them. And we're all set against one another. And you get the results that you get. So in 1912, when we threw the Turk out of Europe, Bulgarian cannon are facing the Chitalja lines just outside of Constantinople. The Greek Navy is basically turning the Aegean into a Greek lake. What happened just a few months later? We had a second Balkan war against each other. Okay, now my grandfather was already in Salt Lake City. He went back. Okay, so when he heard I was going to Bulgaria, or he had already passed away, but my mom said, oh, that, what would your Babu say, you know? But why couldn't we have stuck with that? Why couldn't we have emphasized that? Now, of course, you could say it's because the Bulgarians were this and this and that. That may all be true. I mean, but again, if we had had a greater awareness of what united us, maybe we wouldn't have been so divided. And is it still relevant? That's the question we need to ask. So what do we do now? <clears throat> what do we do now? Why is this relevant? I mean, is this just history, or how do we contextualize it? Well, we need to learn this history. And there's a lot of great books about Byzantium, and there's a lot of great stories about Byzantium. I mean, who here has heard of Justinian and Theodora? There's a lot of drama there. I mean, if you want to make a movie, I don't necessarily know that we could show it in this venue. Uh, but, well, I guess you have different versions. Uh, but you understand what I'm trying to say. Okay, I, I apologize. But, the point, but you understand the point. This is high drama, and this is high politics. And these were great figures. These were historic figures. Why do we not learn about it? Figures. Why do we not have the great novelists write about? Them? Why do we not have the great screen writers about this? Why do we not have, instead of doing a Mamma Mia, which is great, or a big fat Greek wedding, why don't we put some of that effort in to these kind of stories that people have no idea about? We have the opportunity, which we call the marketing first mover advantage. Let's start talking about this before someone else talks about it, right? Before, you know, the, you know, we talk about the conquest of Constantinople and it's over. The Turks did it. Why did Istanbul get the works? It's nobody's business but the Turks because we don't make it our business. If you don't talk about this thousand years of history, it's as if it didn't exist. And we need to teach others about our history. Look, one thing I found interesting is our fellow Americans are fascinated by our history. It's part of Western culture, and yet it's exotic. I mean, especially in this area, can you tell me that your neighbors, when they see Greek this, Greek that, that they don't have a certain degree of fascination with it? Bring them in. Uh, I, in addition to teaching at Clemson University, I teach at their continuing education, and I talk about the history of Eastern Europe. If you contextualize it, if you make it relevant, people will be interested. If you talk about, okay, you want to talk about drama, let's talk about Justinian and Theodore. You want to talk about ancient Greek drama, I'll give you middle Greek drama. You know, you want to talk about cowboys and Indians, I'll give you the Agritis. Right? You want to talk about the philosophers of old? I'll give you the two guys that invented an alphabet and converted a nation, or actually several nations. And the reason why you have orthodoxy and this civilization all the way to Alaska, it has something to do with what happened in Byzantium. 
So we need to contextualize it. I would say that Byzantium remains relevant to this day. It's not just past. Look at what's going on in the Middle East, the abandonment of Eastern Christians, the wholesale abandonment. Again, it's the indifference to what is happening in the East. The threat of Turkey and weaponized refugees. If we can con contextualize this better, people will understand the Turkish threat is not just a Greek neurosis, but is a threat on Western civilization. Uh, one that's you know very painful uh, for my family is the destruction of Yugoslavia. That divide from 1204 ran right through Yugoslavia and split the country in half. And then, of course, you had the Bosnian issue. You, you had a three-way, at least, civilizational war. And who was to blame in Western eyes for all of this? What country was to blame? Which one? The Serbs. In Colombian, you know, in common uh, uh, conventional wisdom, the Serbs were to blame. Because again, they don't talk about what happened. They don't contextualize their history. So this is what happened. The Macedonian issue. Are you going to talk about the Macedonian issue solely on the basis of Alexander the Great and not talk about everything that happened before? Regardless of how you feel about it, you need to know the full context of the history. Look, 1,000 plus years of history are complicated, but they're worth discovering, first of all, because it's who we are, and second of all, because it's so important. So before I open this to discussion, critique, and all the other things, anyone know what that is? I mean, obviously, we know what it is, but where it is? Belgrade. Belgrade. St. Saba Cathedral. It's the largest church in the Balkans with the exception of Hagia Sophia. It sits over Belgrade. How about St. Andrew? I thought that was the largest. It was. Not anymore. This one. It sits over Belgrade like St. Sophia. It was sited purposefully to be a stamp of Byzantium. It's saying, this is who we are. We are Byzantine. And you go in there, and you want to talk about Pelagonis, you just, it opens your soul, and you're reminded of the Kievan Rus uh, dignitaries that came to Constantinople. When they entered that holy temple, they did not know whether they were in heaven or whether they were on earth or in heaven, or was it heaven or on earth, but you get the point. It was so, it was so outer worldly. If you go to St. Salas Cathedral, this is how you feel. I encourage you to go there. And that is a uh, statue of Kyra George, their, uh, their version of Colocotonis. So, again, this is a journey. It's a journey enabled by uh, benefactors such as my, my dear friend Ted and the Archons and all of us. But it's something that we have to do collectively. I'm going to continue this and we all have to do this. This has to be a collective effort. So again, I thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Let me begin by thanking Alex for coming down to give us an amazing presentation. I, I, I think we did well that really. Yeah. 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 We're all learning a lot. I learned a lot. It's great to hear about Byzantium in plain sight, hidden in plain sight, and the successor states and the cultures that continue to evoke Byzantine culture. But the home of Byzantium, Byzantium itself, which is Constantinople, which is called by some Istanbul, 
is not just home to the relics of this great civilization. Byzantium never left Byzantium. Byzantium still exists in Byzantium, in the ecumenical patriarchy. This has continued uninterrupted since before the fall of Constantinople and continues to this day as the successor, as the inheritor of the entire Byzantine culture and the home of our Orthodox faith. The ecumenical patriarchy not only represents our Orthodoxy, but our entire Byzantine culture. To go there, to see, to go to the Church of St. George of the Thanar, to see the, Ec the ecumenical patriarch, is to see Byzantium. The robes that he wears, the robes that all the bishops wear, were the robes of the emperor. The culture has continued uninterrupted. And yet, the Turks conquered us in 1453, but the barbarians are still at the gates. They are still attacking our ecumenical patriarch, and even though they claim that they have tolerance and you know they, they, they make a good PR campaign, but they interfere with the election of the ecumenical patriarch. They don't allow him legal status. There is no ecumenical patriarch in Turkey. They won't even allow him to use the term ecumenical in public. They only consider him the rum patriarch. Rum Patrick, the, the Roman Patriarch, or the, the Bishop of about 2,000 Greeks that still live in Constantinople. They closed the Theological School of Kalki that trained most of our Patriarchs, most of our Bishops, the, the, the number one Theological School in the world. They closed it since 1971, promised so many times that it's ridiculous to open it never have allowed it. They're still attacking. And it's the job of all of us, but especially of the Archons, to defend the Patriarchate, to support him, to prevent the Turks from their final conquest of Constantinople. And this is why it's important. People say to us, well, why is your Greek Orthodox head of the church in a Muslim country, why are they in Turkey? Aren't they, aren't they your enemies? That's our capital. It'll always be my capital. I don't care who runs it. And as far as, as long as I can hold breath, I'll support the patriarchate staying there. And I hope you all will too. And so I want to thank you again, Alex, for, for joining us tonight. Thank you to my wife, my mother, and, and my uh, wife's aunt, and everybody else for the reception tonight, which is um, which is uh, donated uh, by the Archons. Thank you, Archons, for coming. Thank you, uh, Reverend Fathers. So uh -huh.